Joining me now for this week's Moral May segment is Jack Fonseca from the Campaign Life Coalition. Jack, good to see you this week. You too. Happy Easter to you. Happy Easter to you as well. We have a lot of things to discuss this week, but uh, from building a better mousetrap to building a better condom, uh, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, they're offering $100,000 to, uh, to make a new and improved condom. Now, I'll presuppose, from what I know, this foundation does do a lot of great work all around the world, and kudos to Bill Gates for giving away a lot of his wealth uh, to make our, our, our world a better place. But this, this strikes me as a little ridiculous, and maybe... Uh, they should be putting more money towards things like antiretroviral drugs instead of building a bigger condom. Yeah, yeah, I agree. And and what they've what they've offered the money for is an inventor who can make the condom more pleasurable for men. And the theory is, gee, if if it's more pleasurable, then men are more likely to use it, and therefore it'll s slow down the spread of AIDS, other STDs, and uh, reduce the number of unintended pregnancies. The problem is the e exact opposite is what will occur. Because when you uh, promote the condom as safe sex, uh, what you end up with is a higher number of people uh, engaged in recreational sex with more and more partners at younger and younger ages. And as a result, because of the inherent failure rate with condoms, you get greater disease, uh, a more vicious spread of AIDS, and more unintended pregnancies leading to abortion. And uh, to give you some proof on that, the, uh, there was a 2006 study that found that condoms had an inherent failure rate of almost 30% in, pre in preventing the transmission of HPV. And uh, with respect to AIDS, what we know is that condoms have uh, perhaps a 60 to 80% uh, effectiveness rate in preventing the transmission of HIV. Now, when we're talking about uh, preventing the transmission of a fatal disease, a 20 to 40% failure rate is nowhere close to being safe. That's not safe, and this is part of the problem. Uh, again, with, with AIDS, um, condoms have, uh, it's a porous latex rubber material. Yeah. And the condom was never designed to stop, to block H the HIV virus. It was designed to block sperm, mm -hmm. which is over 400 times larger than the HIV virus. So the HIV virus is actually small enough that it can pass through the natural voids in the rubber material. So, um, you know, what we have is, uh, once again, the, uh, the sexual revolution has actually resulted in the destruction of lives, millions of people dying because of the sexual revolution and, and greater recreational sex and uh, the spread of all these diseases. And, um, you know, Bill Gates is too smart to be this stupid. And he's not only a fool, but a dangerous fool for pushing the condom once again. And I think he should be using the $100,000 to reward someone, to challenge someone to put together uh, a, a world-class video that teaches abstinence before marriage and fidelity in marriage, which is truly the only public health tool that can that is 100% effective in blocking uh, and, and well, stopping AIDS. And listen, very frankly, if it's $100,000 on a new and improved condom, I mean, how many antiretroviral drugs does that buy in Africa? That yeah. buys you a heck of a lot, and you can actually treat people who are suffering with this disease today. You can build new facilities. You can take the program that's going on in Uganda that's, that's had resounding success in combating uh, HIV and, and AIDS and put it towards that as, instead of this. I mean, this is one of those things where, I mean, Bill Gates, you said he's a smart guy. He invented Windows as much as Windows drives us crazy at times. Yep. And, and this is what he comes up with. I mean, is, is this an attempt for him to be cool with kind of the in crowd that says, you know what, promiscuity is great and, and let's talk. You know, you don't have to think about sex as as just as, as an anonymous act between partners. I mean, what's driving his attempt at this? I, I think he's in with the overpopulation crowd, and okay. the overpopulation crowd resorts to condoms and uh, you know condoms and abortion. That's what they want to spread around the world. And behind their whole ideology, as well, is the sexual revolution. And uh, the people who actually die as a result of it, uh, or as a result of it, doesn't matter so long as their ideology spreads on. And the uh, taking advantage of the AIDS crisis is, is a way to, to, to keep that uh, sexual revolution agenda alive, unfortunately. Well, never let a crisis go to waste, that's right? right. That's, that's, that's the hallmark of leftists everywhere. Yeah, yeah I mean, this building a better condom thing, I, I can't get my head around it. There's, there must be so many better uses uh, for, sure. for dollars. But um, I think we want to now move on to, and this is even tough for me to say, Victoria's Secret apparently has a new product line for uh, preteen and teenage girls called Bright Young Things, uh, underwear with statements that say, call me and wild and, and, and just, I don't even know where to start with this. I mean, we're talking <laughs> about the sexualization of, of teenage girls and it really is as blatant as that. 
Yeah. Yeah, the, uh, there's uh, moms in the United States are, are outraged by this. Parents are outraged. There's a petition by the uh, mommy lobby that has, I think, almost 10,000 signatures uh, against Victoria's Secret, and, they're, and it's called Stop Sexualizing Our Children. And what Victoria's Secret has done in their spring break campaign to promote their uh, pink line, uh, these, this includes thongs and underwear, and uh, the, the underwear over the crotch actually says, and these are neon colors, and it says, feeling lucky is wow. one of the messages over the crotch, wild, and uh, I think the other one was uh, Call Me. Yeah. So, uh, you know, and, and the company responded by saying, oh, no, no, this is targeting college-age students. And, uh, but in fact, um, the CFO is on record at a, at, a, at a meeting of the organization saying that this is targeting 15 and 16-year-old teens because they want to be older. So this is a great way to fill that need. I, you know what's remarkable to me, Jack, and I, I said this before, I'm not a prude by, by any stretch of the imagination, but, you know, in New York City, you can't buy a big 32-ounce container of pop, but you can buy bright pink underwear for your teenage daughter or preteen daughter that says lucky or call me. I mean, the world must have gone insane when I wasn't paying attention. Yeah. That's the yeah. only conclusion I can reach. <laughs> well, I think parents need to, uh, I think parents should boycott Victoria's Secret. I mean, those who who maybe haven't been in tune with this, uh, you know, they're targeting your, 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 your daughters, your daughters who are barely, uh, pu you know, pubescent, and they're targeting them with the sexualization and kind of encouraging them to, to be promiscuous. It's, it's absurd and it's disgusting. Amen. Brain death, this is a tough one. Um, when people um, are, are, are deemed medically that their brain is no longer really functioning, but their body still is, and, and they, we give organs away, which is a good thing, organ donation, um, I'm a supporter of that. But there are questions uh, from a bioethical perspective on whether or not brain dead is something that is a true medical condition, and should we be taking that life? Yeah. The latest article, uh, or the latest is uh, issue in the Journal of Medicine and Philosophy has an article by a, um, a bio an American bioethicist, Dr. Christian Brugger, in which he, uh, he, he questions the validity of brain death criteria, and he suggests that uh, we're, it's not true. There's no such thing as brain death. And when we remove vital organs, we're actually killing innocent people. We're causing their deaths. And this is totally true. I've studied, we've studied this, this uh, subject. And um, brain death is not real death. In 1968, an ad hoc committee at Harvard University um, um, put together this, this committee to redefine death for the purpose of harvesting organs from people, vital organs from people who, in fact, were not dead. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, prior to 1968, the, the method of determining death by doctors and, and physicians was to check for, uh, for the vital signs of temperature, pulse, blood pressure, and respiration. And in the absence of those things, you're dead, you're a cadaver. With brain death, all of those things are still happening. People have temperature, they have a pulse, they have blood pressure, they're breathing, and, um, and, and there's so many cases of, that prove it to be a lie, such as uh, the case in 2008, NBC did a piece on it, of Zach Dunlap. He's a man who was declared, 21-year-old man in a motor vehicle accident. He, he was declared brain dead. He was minutes away from the uh, organ harvesting team, cutting him open and taking his heart, when his cousin just had a feeling that he wasn't really dead. So he took his penknife out of his pocket, scraped it under his foot, and saw his, 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 his foot jerk. Yeah. So then he dug his fingernail under Zach's fingernail and saw his arm come across his chest. So they sent the organ harvesting team away. Zach had a full recovery, and now he retells the story of how he was unable to move or speak, but he could hear the doctors talking yeah. about him brain, being There's brain dead. There's more evidence that we treat life in a far too uh, cavalier manner. Jack Fonseca, Campaign Life Coalition, thank you. Thank you.